Well, it's now a minute after, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar today. I'm Jennifer Boyko. I'm the Senior Manager of Scientific Operations with the CLSA, our Longitudinal Study on Aging. Thanks for joining us. And the webinar is entitled Examining the Social Environment and its Relevance to Healthy Aging in the CLSA. As always, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the CLSA National Coordinating Center and McMaster University are located on the territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee Nations and within the lands protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous people, uh, peoples, including the Haudenosaunee uh, Anishinaabek Nation and Anishinaabek based nations. Uh, University of Laval, who we also have uh, presented from today, is situated on land um, that is at a crossroads of the Nyon Wensio of the Huron Wendat people, the Indatina of the Wabanaki people. Uh, the Endasina of the Innu people, the Natakinan of the uh, Atikamek people, and the Wolastui of the Wolasco Way people. Uh, as attendees of this webinar, I encourage you to continue your learning following the webinar and to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the land where we currently have the privilege to do research, to live, and to work wherever that may be for you. Now let's review a few housekeeping points. Uh, They're on your screen, but I will also go over them here. First, everyone but the presenters will be muted throughout the webinar. If you need to change or test your audio during the webinar, you can just click audio settings on the bottom of the Zoom window. At the end of today's session, there will be a question and answer period. If you have a question for the presenter, uh, presenters during the webinar, you can post it in the Q&A box that is located in the bottom toolbar. The questions will be addressed at the very end, and all questions will be visible to attendees. If you have any technical difficulties, though, concerning the webinars, I ask you to use the chat, bo chat box, which is on the uh, side of your screen, to communicate with our webinar team. A feedback survey will be launched at the end of the webinar, um, and we invite you to complete it after exiting today. The, the survey will does give us important information and feedback so that we can use we can use to plan future webinars for you. So today's webinar, like I said, is entitled Examining the Social Environment and its Relevance to Healthy Aging in the CLSA. This webinar will be presented by Professor Diva Nielsen of McGill University and Catherine Labonte of uh, Laval University. Professor Nielsen is a Canada Research Chair Tier 2 in Ingestive Behavior and an Associate Professor in the School of Human Nutrition at McGill. Her research examines diverse biological and social factors that relate to eating behavior and health. She applies and she applies epidemiological and experimental methods to comprehensively investigate complex patterns of relationships between behavior and health. Catherine Labonte received her PhD in cognitive psychology from Laval University. Her expertise is in human decision making, and she has worked on multidisciplinary projects focused on performance in complex work environments, food-related inhibition, social factors, and cognition. Uh, she's currently a research professional at Laval, where she works on the assessment of climate change knowledge um, among the general public, while also conducting experimental research in cognitive psychology. So I will now turn it over to Dr. Nielsen, who will uh, share her screen and begin our webinar today. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm going to get my slides up. Does that look good? Hold on. There. Now I think this is good. So I'm really pleased to present this webinar with Catherine, my co-presenter today. Catherine was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab when we conducted these analyses with CLSA data. So I'm very pleased that um, she could be here. She since moved on from McGill University to Université Laval. So I'll give a quick outline of our webinar for today. I'll start by giving an overview of what is already known about social factors and their relevance for health. 
and then get into what we did in this investigation to build upon the knowledge base. We conceptualized what we're referring to as a social environment, uh, reflecting the extent of people's social connections in the CLSA. So we used a statistical procedure known as latent class analysis to do this. And I'll go over the social variables from CLSA that we used to conceptualize this variable. I'll then get into a project we did where we looked at relationships between the social environment variable and nutritional outcomes. And then I'll hand it over to Catherine to discuss uh, an analysis of looking at the relationship of the social environment with cognitive outcomes. And then we look forward to a <clears throat> nice and fruitful discussion uh, to conclude the webinar. So there's increased recognition that social factors are quite relevant in the aging process. They are not only relevant to mental well-being, but also physical well-being and risk factors for chronic disease. And in today's webinar, we're going to be focusing on the links between social factors and nutrition, as well as cognitive health, as the areas that we focused on <clears throat> to look with um, aging. Oh, sorry, I see someone connecting. Jennifer, I see you're, you're on the screen. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and the World Health Organization has recently put more resources into study, studying social factors. Um, there's been a new commission la launched on social connection globally, um, as social environments have been recognized to be major influences on how aging is experienced. And lack of social connection has been shown to carry an equal or even larger risk of premature mortality compared to other risk factors that have been well studied, such as smoking, alcohol consumption, physical inactivity, obesity, and air pollution. Now, social connection is a multifactorial construct. It's defined as the extent to which an individual is connected to others in their day-to-day -day lives, and it reflects multiple elements. So one element of social connect connection is the structural aspects. So these are the real existence of connections that people have with others and the meaning of those connections to them. So this can be things like relationship status, um, living arrangements, uh, individuals' social networks and their connections to friends, colleagues, people in their communities. So real existence of actual connections to others. There are also the functional part of social connection. And this is the perception of individuals to have availability to various supports. Um, and it's also their perceptions of feeling lonely or isolated. And the third element of social connection is the quality of those connections. So how positive or negatively they're viewed by the individual. So this gets into the nuances of the quality of relationships with others and the extent to which an individual feels included or excluded in their social life. So we wanted to explore a construct of a social environment representing those multifactorial aspects of social connection and how this is related to nutritional outcomes. We focused on a measure known as nutritional risk. <clears throat> nutritional risk is um, encompassing risk factors and determinants of food intake and particularly poor food intake that can eventually lead to malnutrition if not addressed <clears throat> in a proper fashion. And older aged individuals are known to be more vulnerable to nutritional risk. And this is a result of a couple of factors. It's both biological and physiological related to the aging process, which has been linked to weakened sensory perception, so the ability to taste and smell, uh, reductions in appetite. And on the social side, uh, as individuals age, they often require assistance with obtaining their food and preparing their food. So both biological and social factors are relevant in nutritional risk. There have been several studies that have looked at individual social factors and nutrition outcomes. So I'll go over some that have been associated with nutritional risk specifically. Low social support, uh, social isolation, and limited social networks have been related to an increased prevalence of nutritional risk. And also a concept known as social cohesion. This is the extent to which an individual feels that they belong within their community and those who are closest to them. So poor social cohesion has been related to higher nutritional risk. There has also been interesting evidence on social participation, and this includes longitudinal evidence. So studies done over time, 
much of the literature on social factors and health has been cross-sectional in nature, meaning it's studied the exposure and the outcome at the same time. But we see now an emergence of longitudinal studies looking over time. So infrequent social participation has been linked to increases in nutritional risk status over time. And conversely, having a partner or being in a relationship has been reported to be protective against nutritional risk. Now, I also wanted to present some of the knowledge around how social factors are associated with diet, because diet is the mechanism that's underlying nutritional risk status. So we thought it was important to look at dietary factors as well. Um, so having a stable partner in someone's life has been linked with better consumption of fruits and vegetables over time. So this is another example of longitudinal evidence for social factors and diet outcomes. And greater social support and greater social participation have been linked with better overall diet quality. So not just fruits and vegetables consumption, but the overall quality of diet. So it's clear that social factors do have relevance for nutrition and for a variety of other health-related outcomes that are linked to aging. However, most previous research has investigated social factors individually. But social factors exist as a combination of different aspects. And so in this work, we really sought out to try to conceptualize a social environment that reflected multiple individual social factors that are relevant to this concept of social connection. And we wanted to see if this aggregated social environment variable could provide novel insight into how social factors are relevant for aging. So I think several of the attendees are familiar with this image. It's a classic description of the CLSA research platform. For this project, we utilize data from the comprehensive cohort only because it's the cohort that contains the really rich and detailed data on social factors. So we focused on the 30,000 individuals as part of the comprehensive cohort. And we'll be presenting results that worked with the baseline data from CLSA but we do have plans to continue our work with the longitudinal data and incorporate the follow-up information. So to derive our social environment variable, we conducted uh, something known, known as a latent structure analysis. That's the general term to describe this type of an, anal an, an analytical approach. This is a person-centered approach that looks on patterns of responses from individual participant data, and it's often from survey data. Now to do this, the investigators need to identify a set of indicator predictor variables that you use in the modeling. And these need to be correlated variables. So they're separate variables, but they are related to one another. So in our case, we had multiple separate but related social variables. And what a latent structure analysis does is it identifies underlying subgroups in the data that are considered to be latent or hidden. So the concept is that this latent variable can't be directly measured from the data that has been collected, but it can be estimated indirectly through those indicator predictor variables. So this latent variable can be predicted from the indicators that have been collected in the data. And then when you run the latent structure analysis, a number of classes emerge. So I'm using the term latent class analysis. That was the specific form of this analysis that we conducted because our indicator variables were categorical in nature. <clears throat> so this statistical approach has a couple of different terminologies depending on the structure of those indicator predictor variables. So in our case, our case, we were working with latent class analysis. So this latent variable emerges from the analysis is separated into a number of classes that are representing distinct groups of the participants. And the number of classes that emerge is a choice of the investigators. So we analyzed a combination of different class models to look at the best fit for the data. And I'll get into the best fit that we chose. But first I'd like to go over those indicator variables that we worked with. We had seven indicator variables, but in total, they represented 24 countable survey items from the CLSA. Now I say countable because in actuality, in actuality, about 40 variables were used, but some of them had been previously collapsed into derived variables. 
So we had 24 countable variables that we fed into our latent class analysis. And they were combined into seven groups reflecting the following social factors. So we had network size, which was representing the number of individuals related to a participant that occupied meaningful relationship roles. So things like the number of close friends and the number of close family members. We had a social isolation index that we modeled based off of previous work conducted with the CLSA. Uh, and this is an index that looks at objective measures of linkages in one's social networks. We also had social cohesion. This is a concept of how someone feels they belong within their community. Uh, so things like reciprocity, altruism, shared norms and values within the community. And we had four measures of social support, and these come from the Medical Outcomes Study Social Support Survey. And there are four uh, support subscales that were available in the CLSA data. So these were related to participants' perceptions of emotional and tangible supports, affection, and how, quality, or how positive or negative their social interactions were perceived to be. So in total, these seven indicator variables that we utilized reflected those three elements of social connection that I described earlier. And to identify the ideal number of classes that uh, represented our data the best, we utilized predetermined criteria for latent class analysis as described in the literature. And so we looked at a two class, three class and four class model, and we compared metrics that indicated the goodness of fit, um, how well participants were separated into the emerging latent classes and the likelihood that individuals uh, had a probability of being assigned to the classes that emerged. And so when we looked at those criteria, it was quite clear that a three class model best represented our data. And so these are the classes that emerged. I'll be referring to them as social environment profiles as we go forward, because we felt that social classes wasn't really the right term for this project. So we're using social profiles. So we had three profiles that the latent class analysis recognized. And we referred to them as weaker, intermediate, and stronger profiles. And this represented the level of social connection in the CLSA data. And what the 3D plots are showing on the x-axis is our indicator variables, the seven variables I mentioned. The z-axis is the categorical value for the variable. And the y-axis is the number of participants that fell into those categories. So in general, a higher score for these values is representing higher social connection. The exception is for social isolation. For that one, lower values represent uh, less likelihood of being socially isolated. But when you see this pattern that most of the scores are increasing across those profiles, it's indicating that the social connection is becoming stronger across those three profiles. So we labeled them as weaker, intermediate, and stronger social environment profiles, and they represented 17%, 40%, and 43% of the CLSA sample, respectively. So now that we created our social environment variable, we wanted to try to address a couple of knowledge gaps. So on the nutrition side, we wanted to see how this social environment might be related to nutritional risk because that extends the existing literature that has looked at social factors individually. And if there is an association with our social environment profile variable, we wanted to try to understand what dietary factors might be relevant. So these are our objectives and hypothesis. We primarily sought out to determine whether the social environment that we had constructed was related to nutritional risk. And secondary, we wanted to determine if dietary intake of healthful food groups differed across those social environment profiles. So we focused on healthful foods that would be promoted for healthy aging um, and didn't include foods that would be advised to be consumed more moderately. And we hypothesized that a stronger social environment would be associated with lower nutritional risk status and higher consumption of healthful foods. So the measurements that we used in this analysis were the screen to abbreviated tool, which is also known as the screen eight. Uh, this is a way of assessing nutritional risk. It's comprised of eight main questions and three follow-up questions. 
looking at weight changes, skipping meals, appetite, the ability to chew and swallow food, consumption of fruits and vegetables, fluid intake, time spent eating alone, and meal preparation patterns, whether the individual prepared their own meals or if they had someone preparing the meals for them. And this adds to a score with a possible value of 48, and a score of under 38 indicates high nutritional risk status. For the food groups, we use CLSA's short dietary questionnaire. This is a 36 item food and beverage survey. And the raw responses were converted into number of times eaten per day. So that's the unit of measurement. Um, it's important to keep in mind, this doesn't quantify food intake. It didn't have information on portion sizes, um, but it looked at the average daily consumption of these food items. So the number of times consumed per day. And we created four healthful food groups using 27 of the items. So these food groups were whole grains, protein foods, dairy foods, and fruits and vegetables that we looked at both with and without juices included. And for our statistics, we used analysis of covariance where we adjusted for an increasing set of covariates that we had pre-identified. Uh, model one was minimally adjusted for age, sex, and province of recruitment. Model two added additional socio-demographic factors to the model. And model three additionally added lifestyle factors. <clears throat> so our results were identical across the models. So I'll only be presenting results from model three. And we performed these models in the entire CLSA sample that was available for the analysis. And we also looked by two age groups, middle-aged and older-aged CLSA participants. This is the flowchart of participants in the analysis. When we worked with the data that were available for our exposure variables and the outcomes, we were left with roughly 20,000 participants for the analysis. And these are their participant characteristics. I just want to draw your attention that the nutritional risk status was very similar between the middle-aged and older-aged group, but their social environment profile did differ. So the older-age subgroup had a higher proportion of subjects in the weaker social environment profile. And when we looked at the nutritional risk score, we saw what we are calling a nice dose-response pattern. So Across these social environment profiles, the weaker is in white and the stronger is in dark gray. And then these are our two age subgroups. So the nutritional risk scores increased as the social environment strength increased. And we saw that those in the weaker profile actually had a score for nutritional risk that was below that cutoff of 38. So that indicated that these participants would be considered at high nutritional risk status and at a greater risk of malnutrition compared to the stronger social environment profiles. And these were statistically significant patterns. And we looked at the individual questions in the screen too abbreviated, and we saw significant differences across all of the questions for the social environment profiles. So compared to the weaker profile, the intermediate and stronger profiles had higher frequencies of reporting a stable body weight, not skipping meals, having a good appetite, not having difficulty chewing or swallowing their food, good daily consumption of fruits and vegetables, adequate fluid intake, and almost always having someone to consume their meals uh, and not needing to cook their own meals. And when we looked at the food group consumption, this varied a bit um, depending on the age subgroup, but the most consistent pattern was for fruits and vegetables. So the consumption of fruits and vegetables was significantly higher as the social environment strength uh, increased. And this was consistent in all the samples, the total CLSA participants and the two age groups. And so it really reflected that dose response pattern that we saw with the nutritional risk score. Um, if we have questions about the other items, I'm happy to take them during the Q&A, but they varied a little bit more for proteins and dairy. And for whole grains, we saw no differences in consumption frequency between the social environment profiles. So just to wrap up on my side before I hand it over to Catherine, we did in see, indeed see that the conceptualized social environment variable that we had created was significantly associated with nutritional risk. 
And this association followed a dose response pattern where the nutritional risk scores increased in relation to the strength of the social environment. And this relationship seems to have um, some significance with fruit and vegetable intake. That was the food group that consistently showed the same dose response pattern that we saw for nutritional risk. So I'm pleased to turn it over to Catherine for the rest of the webinar. Hi everyone, I am just going to share my slides. It shouldn't be too long. So do you all see my um my slides on the screen? Dr. Nielsen, if you can just let me know if yes, yes, okay. it looks good. Thank you very much. Um I first wanted to thank the organizers for inviting us uh, to present. And now my role is to present the results of a study that we did to look at the relationship between uh, the social environment profile and cognitive performance in the CLSA. As you probably already know, aging comes with normal cognitive alterations. And uh, these alterations include a decrease in the speed with which older individuals can process information or a decrease in their ability to focus their attention on multiple tasks at the same time. There are uh, many studies that suggest that factors like social support or social participation can promote cognitive health in the elderly. But like for nutritional risk, little research has examined the relationship between cognitive function and a combination of social factors that reflect a social environment. So we aim to evaluate the relationship between uh, social environment profiles of various strengths and cognitive performance. And our social environment profiles here were composed in the same way as what you have just seen with the nutritional risk study. So they were based on uh, network size, social support, social cohesion, and social isolation. And our hypothesis was that a stronger social environment profile would be associated with better cognitive performance in the CLSA. Most cognitive tests included in the CLSA can be divided into three general cognitive domains. And the first domain is called executive function. And this one represents a set of mental skills that allow us to control our thoughts and our behavior. So for example, executive functions make it possible for us to plan and to organize a busy day and to adapt to unexpected events. The second domain is called prospective memory and it consists of the ability to remember to perform an intended action in the future. So it can be, for example, uh, remembering to call someone who asked you to call them later today at 7 p.m. And the last domain is episodic memory, and it refers to the ability to recall specific events or experience from the past, such as uh, remembering what you ate for dinner last night. As I just mentioned, executive function is a set of diverse skills that help us control our thoughts and behavior. And the CLSA includes four cognitive tests that can be considered as measuring some executive functioning skills. The first one is called the mental alternation test and it measures uh, mental flexibility. So this test requires participants to dictate numbers and letters in alternation as many times as possible for 30 seconds, starting with number one and then the letter A and then number two and the letter B and so on, as you can see on the screen. The second test is called the Stroop test and it's used to measure attention and inhibition. In this test, participants had to name the color of the ink of color words that were printed on a card. And you can see an example here where uh, the correct answer would be red, green, and blue, because we're only interested in the color in which the words are written, but not in the words themselves. Participants also completed the animal fluency test to measure uh, verbal category fluency. And in this test, they simply needed to name as many animals as possible in one minute, like cat, dog, and horse. And finally, they completed the control oral word association test to measure phonological fluency. 
In this test, they uh, were asked to name as many words that begin with a given letter as possible in one minute. So if they were, for example, given the letter A, they had to name words such as apple, all, and animal. Now to measure prospective memory or the ability to remember to execute a planned action, the CLSA includes two types of tasks from the Miami Prospective Memory Test. And the first one is called an event-based task, which means that a participant had to remember to do something when a specific event occurred. In this case, they had to try to remember uh, to take certain banknotes from an envelope as soon as they heard a timer go up. And they specifically had to give a $5 bill to the experimenter and to keep a $10 bill for themselves. And they did not know that the timer would go off uh, exactly 30 minutes after the experimenter gave them the instructions. The second task is called a time-based prospective memory task. And this means that this time, this time participants had to remember to do something after a predefined period of time instead of after an event. So in this case, they had to try to remember to give the experimenter a specific card from an envelope exactly 15 minutes after being asked to. And for this, they had to monitor a clock. And uh, finally, the CLSA includes a short version of the uh, rate auditory verbal learning test. And it's used to measure episodic memory, which is the ability to recall specific events from the past. And in the test used here, participants first uh, listen to a list of 15 common words like uh, coffee, school, and moon. And immediately after hearing the list, they were asked to try to recall as many of those uh, 15 words as possible. But the test also included another step where participants were asked to try to recall the words five minutes after hearing the list. So they had to do their best to recall the words that they had heard a few minutes before. Each of the tests that I just presented was associated with its own performance indicator. And it could be, for example, the number of words recalled or the number of animals uh, that were produced depending on the test. And to bring the results of each test on a common scale, we transform them into Z scores. So to put it very simply, a Z score is just a different way of uh, presenting the original test scores so that the mean score in the sample is now equal to zero. And this means that all scores below the mean are now represented by negative values, and all scores above the mean are now represented by positive values. So for example, if a participant has recalled uh, five words in the episodic memory test, but the mean number of words recalled in the entire sample was six words, then this participant would have a negative Z score for this this process was done uh, separately for individuals who completed the test in English or in French because the tests are not always equivalent across languages. But then the Z scores of both languages were combined again, and uh, the scores for the test within a given cognitive domain were also combined so that we had an average score for each domain. So this means that for each participant, we had one Z score for executive function, one Z score for prospective memory, and one Z score for episodic memory. And in all cases, a higher score always represented better cognitive performance. Once we had uh, the Z scores for each domain, we wanted to examine whether cognitive performance varied according to the three social environment profiles, which represented a weaker, an intermediate, and a stronger social environment. So we again ran analyses of covariance on the Z scores, and these analyses were adjusted for an increasing set of preselected covariates. In the first statistical model, we only adjusted for sociodemographic factors like age, sex, and education. In model two, we adjusted for those same variables, but we also added lifestyle factors uh, like alcohol consumption or sleep time. Then in model three, we, we added mental health factors like the history of anxiety or uh, mood disorders. 
And in model four, we also added general health factors like the number of uh, chronic conditions and comorbidities. For the sake of time, I will only show the results of the fully adjusted model in the presentation, but I can already tell you that the pattern of results was very similar across models. Sorry, across models. As you can see here, uh, the study sample was composed of all CLSA participants at baseline. But as you can see on the top right, we excluded participants who had incomplete data for the social environment or uh, cognition related variables, who did not complete uh, the all cognitive tests in the same language or those who had a medical condition that was likely to impact cognitive functioning like dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And this left us with nearly uh, 20,000 participants, but some were excluded from the analysis due to missing data on the covariates that were included in each model. So our final sample in uh, model four included ne nearly 19,000 participants. Here, I quickly show you some of the sociodemographic characteristics of the sample, which tended to differ between the social environment groups. Um, to give you just a few examples, the weaker social environment group was slightly older than the intermediate group, which in turn was slightly older than the stronger social environment group. The level of education also tended to increase with the strength of the social environment. Another example is that uh, the weaker social environment group included a smaller proportion of Caucasian individuals than the other groups. But even though our groups differed in, term, in terms of uh, sociodemographic characteristics, we controlled for these variables in the analysis, as I mentioned before. So this allowed us to compare cognitive performance across the three social environment profiles as if participants all had uh, similar sociodemographic characteristics. Here, you can see the results of the analysis, and the graph illustrates the z-score for each social environment group and each cognitive domain with executive function on the left, prospective memory in the middle, and episodic memory on the right. I remind you that a z-score of zero represents the mean score of the entire sample for a given cognitive domain, and it's represented by the horizontal line on the graph. And we can see that the weaker social environment group, which uh, is represented by white bars, had a mean cognitive performance that was below the mean of the entire sample for all three domains. The intermediate social environment group uh, is represented by pale gray bars, and their average performance was very close to the mean of the entire sample for all three domains. And it was even exactly on the mean for executive function, which is why we do not see a pale gray bar in this case. And uh, the stronger social environment group, which is represented by dark gray bars, had a cognitive performance that was above the sample mean for all three domains. The differences between the three social environment profiles were statistically significant. So th this means that the stronger social environment profile had a better performance than the intermediate group, which in turn had a better performance than the weaker social environment group. And this was true for all three cognitive domains. But I have to say that the differences between the groups were rather small. To summarize, our results showed that performance on cognitive tests increased with the strength of the social environment, and this was consistent with our hypothesis, and this was true for the three cognitive domains that we tested. The differences in cognitive performance that we observed uh, were small, so they did not amount to very large differences on the cognitive tests. But I wanted to mention that when comparing middle age and older age individuals, we can see that effects tend to be larger for older individuals. And I did not have time to present these results today, but this could mean that the social environment plays a greater role in cognitive performance among older adults. And finally, I wanted to mention that the results that I just presented are based on the unweighted CLSA data, but the pattern of results is similar when we apply the CLSA survey weight. 
it's now time for me to give you a brief overview of some strengths and limitations of our two studies. And one of the strengths of our project is that we conceptualize the social environment in an exhaustive manner by considering network size, social support, social cohesion, and social isolation. And we focus on the connection with other individuals to define the social environment. But we acknowledge that other factors like financial support um, or governmental support could be considered as part of the social environment, depending on how it's defined. Also, the social environment data was self-reported. So there could have been inaccuracies in participants' responses due to uh, social desirability, or even just because participants could have had difficulties recalling the social encounters that they had in the past few months. One limitation uh, specifically related to the nutrition analysis is that we measured the frequency of consumption of healthy food groups, but we did not assess portion size. So even though frequency of consumption was generally lower in the weaker social environment group, we're not able to determine whether their intakes were insufficient. And for the cognition analysis, we decided to focus our study on uh, cognitively healthy participants, but the results may have differed if we had studied individuals who reported medical conditions that were likely to impact cognitive functioning. And finally, the directionality of the relationship cannot be established because we conducted cross-sectional studies. So for example, our results might suggest that social factors can help maintain cognitive function, but the association could also be reversed and it's possible that having poorer cognitive health might instead lead individuals to withdraw from social life. In conclusion, our studies showed that a stronger social environment is associated with less nutritional risk, with more frequent consumption of certain healthy food groups and with better cognitive functioning. And our results align with previous observations that showed a productive impact of uh, social factors on these health outcomes. But our studies also expand the current body of research by uh, suggesting that the relationship between social factors, nutritional risk, and cognition also hold when we consider multiple social factors in combination. And finally, we just want to thank all collaborators and trainees on the project. We also want to thank the CLSA research team and of course the participants, and we want to thank our sources of funding. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully everyone can hear me a little bit better now. I was, uh, I retested my microphone, so hopefully that's better. Um, thank you again to both of you for an excellent presentation. I'd now like to open it up to questions. Uh, just a reminder that the muting will remain on. So you will not be able to speak, but you can enter your questions into the Q&A box that's in the bottom of the Zoom window. So that's not the chat, that's the Q&A that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So we have about 15 minutes. Uh, the first question is, uh, um, was type 2 diabetes a factor in your study? I guess I can start on the nutritional risk. It was not something that we considered. Um, we looked at the CLSA participants uh, as a whole, and I, I, from my interpretation is the question is related to the nutritional risk uh, outcome and the dietary variables. Um, we wanted to look at the participants as much as we could. And we controlled for sociodemographic factors that we thought could be relevant to the relationships and also lifestyle factors. But it's a good point. We didn't look at kind of management of a chronic disease in the nutritional risk project. But I would imagine that the associations for chronic disease management um, would potentially be similar or if not more pronounced. Um, because I think that there's more mindfulness around the importance of, of diet, but if the social support is inadequate, um, you could see more pronounced relationships between the social environment and nutritional risk status. So a nice question, we could certainly explore it more on the nutritional risk side. Um, Catherine, I think, took into account the chronic disease uh, factors with cognition, correct? Yes, and sorry, I had to, uh... 
stop sharing because I couldn't see our, our faces. Um, but if I need to share the slides again, I will share them. So yes, uh, diabetes was part of uh, the chronic conditions that we controlled for in our final uh, statistical model. Uh, so the next question, did your team or teams consider multiple imputation to handle the missing data rather than exclude these individuals with missing data? A very nice question. So for multiple imputation with the social factors, we felt it wouldn't be appropriate um, because we were trying to derive these social environment profiles from the responses. And I felt that imputing social information wouldn't be appropriate for that particular part of the analysis, deriving the social environment profiles. So we really wanted to work with the data that were there and available rather than making some estimates. It was possible. And if we had imputed data for the social factors, I would have done some sensitivity analyses to compare. But um, if the results were similar with the imputed data versus just the data that were available. So a very good point. Um, this is why we didn't apply imputation for the social factors. And for the analyses, uh, for the covariates, it, it was an approach that we could have done. It was more of a time sensitivity. We had trainees involved in um, the project and it just seemed more feasible to work with data that were available. Um, so that was the reason why multiple imputation wasn't uh, applied for the analyses, but it's a good point and something we can try to incorporate into future work, especially looking with the longitudinal data um, and of course, it is a limitation. There could be some bias introduced into our findings as a result of some missing data. But fortunately for the covariates, the proportion of missing data was rather low. Our sample sizes were reduced primarily because of missing information for the social factors. So I hope that answers the question. Catherine, would you like to add anything further? No, I think you mentioned everything. Yeah, and same for the cognitive ones. I think imputing cognitive results, uh, we'd feel a little uh, uncomfortable with that for the cognitive project. But again, if we had done it, we would have done sensitivity analyses to look at the comparison of findings. And so a couple more queries about the analytical approach. Uh, how, so those sort of three questions, how, res how were respondents assigned to the latent classes? Uh, was it based on the highest probability or class membership of class membership? And what was the value of entropy in the best fit latent model? So I have a supplementary slide. Catherine, maybe I can ask you to share. Is that okay? Uh, I'm going to tell you the slide number in just a second. It's 47. So it was the highest probability that was used to assign the participant to the corresponding latent class. And the slide should show the metrics that we used. Let's get it up in a moment. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so this is showing the summary information that we evaluated for um, assigning class membership and determining the optimal number of classes. So the three class model, uh, what we look at is lower goodness of fit values. So the AIC, A1, AIC, BIC, and chi-square goodness of fit, they were lowest in the three class model. Our entropy value around 0.83 um, was kind of intermediate, but because our, between the three options, but because our goodness of fit was the lowest for the three and our posterior probabilities for the three class model were superior to the four class model. So these were the metrics that we used to assess the optimal number of classes and the three class model was really the, the clear choice um, that provided the best representation of participants. And so it was the posterior probabilities that was used to assign class membership. Hopefully that answers that uh, question. Uh, the next question is, I would like to know if you consider disabilities such as vision and hearing amongst older adults that affect their cognitive status. Um, and Kathy Pecora Fuller noted that more specifically, uh, both social and nutrition profiles may mediate the known associations between sensory and cognitive decline. So um, I think reinforcing the, the inquiry of the question. Uh, let me just go back to 
my notes because for the uh, covariates used in the analysis, uh, we really based our choice on uh, previous studies. Um, so no, there is no, uh, mm, they were not considered uh, as a covariate, but of course it would be a very good thing to add them. A couple more follow-up questions. Were there sex-related uh, differences or did you disaggregate by sex? It's a good question. We did not disaggregate by sex. It was controlled for in the analyses, but it is a future direction. Um, the focus of the work was more on age, to look at age separation, the middle-aged subgroup and the older-aged subgroup of participants. Um, and we did see more pronounced associations in the older-aged. But it is possible that there could be sex differences as well. Um, we didn't explore it in the present work. We were a little bit um, concerned over multiple testing. We did adjust our p-values to reflect um, multiple testing. So our threshold was uh, less than 0 0.01 for statistical significance. Um, and so we kind of stopped with what we had done, but of course it would be interesting to explore sex differences and in subsequent work, it's something we can examine. I'm trying to think if there could be, I, I feel like there probably would be some sex differences. It's hard to hypothesize the directions. Like I, I want to kind of say that men might be more vulnerable to nutritional risk if they don't have adequate social support, but it's, um, I, I'd have to explore it a little bit more. The literature does seem to suggest that uh, having a partner, so being in a relationship seems to be quite an important social factor. So um, it would be interesting to examine sex differences and relationship patterns. And for cognition, maybe Catherine, I don't know if you could comment on possible sex differences you might anticipate. Well, there generally are not uh, much differences. Um, for, perhaps uh, women could perform better in what is more related to verbal cognition, whereas men may tend to uh, perform better in visual spatial. Um, cognition, but it's uh, sometimes pretty small differences. And in general, I would say no difference would be expected. But uh, for the cognition analysis too, we did not compare um, males and females, and we only uh, used sex as a covariate in the analysis. The next question is, is chronic pain a variable in the sealistic CLSA data, and is that factor considered in the comorbidities, um, chronic conditions for your models? Do you want a to... very good question? Yes. I I believe chronic pain is available, yeah. Catherine. Are you... Yeah, I, I didn't have it in the nutritional re results, but I I can see the relevance for the kind of physical aspects of of chewing and swallowing. Um, it would have been an interesting one, I think, to include, but we we didn't. Catherine, do you want to add for your project? Yes, uh, we did not include it in the cognition analysis either. Uh, so I think it would be interesting to include it. But what we had was more um, diseases like high blood pressure or um, uh, bronchitis or really, um, let's say, specific diseases, but not... Uh, chronic pain, which can be uh, related to many diseases. Uh, we had, however, functional ability, so the ability to live and function independently sorry, in society, but we did not have uh, chronic pain uh, itself. Okay, and uh, next one, was there a healthcare policy uh, or recommendation to change based on your findings? I, I, is it correct to interpret changing on the social environment aspect? I think that's my interpretation. Hopefully I'm, I'm correct there. Um, I think the, the work adds a nice layer of richness to what's already known about social factors. There's been a lot of work done on individual social factors and consistent findings of their relevance to outcomes related to aging. Um, in our case, we aggregated multiple social factors and we see the same pattern. For nutritional risk, the effect size was actually rather relevant. It was a medium effect size. We calculated Cohen's D. So between the weaker profile and the stronger profile, the two uh, extreme groups, 
Um, so I, I believe it is showing that social factors as a whole are quite relevant to adequate nutrition and that we should have more recognition and um, approaches in communities and from a public health perspective to facilitate better social connections. And as I said at the start of the webinar, the World Health Organization is really spearheading some really interesting initiatives on trying to improve social connections um, in all countries of all incomes, recognizing the relevance of that. And I think, you know, coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, reflecting a little bit on um, being more isolated, uh, not being physically as present with others, um, that that can certainly be a challenging experience. And so I think that in public health, there is greater interest in improving social connections and fostering this. So um, in terms of specific programs for nutrition, we discussed in the article that was published, it's in the Journal of Nutrition, about meal programs being more targeted to areas that are showing higher levels of social, social isolation or um, some patterns of individuals showing less availability of social support. So kind of targeting those meal programs a little bit more to the social context could be a strategy. Um, and from a clinician perspective, evaluating the social health of, of patients, um, starting to have those conversations and ask if the patients have uh, individuals connections for support uh, to access food, to prepare their meals. I think it's something from a clinical perspective that could be uh, further integrated into practice. Catherine, did you want to add for cognition? Uh, yes, so for the cognitive analysis, the effect size were very small. So although there were significant differences between the groups, when you look at the performance on the cognitive test, the performance is not that much different across the groups. And um, I think further studies would be needed before uh, making any uh, public health recommendation. And it would also be interesting to perhaps see the influence of the social environment in relation to other factors that are known to be related to cognition. For example, see if someone has a a genetic predispos predisposition uh, for uh, some cognitive uh, disease. Does, um, does the social environment help more uh, this individual than others? But when we consider everyone together, as we did here, uh, the, although there is an, an effect of the social environment on cognition, it was very small for this study. And it's consistent with uh, other studies um, when that looked at individual social factors uh, and their relationship to cognition in the CLSC. And I think the next question uh, addresses uh, what we just talked about in terms of policy recommendations. So Emily, I hope your, your question was already answered. Um, and we have three more questions, which we can hopefully get through in the last minute or two. Um, so I note the second part of the presentation, you mentioned comparing results with and without weights. Can you mention or mention again if the work of the first part of the presentation compared results, including the latent class analysis with and without weights? Nice question. The weights we didn't apply to the latent class analysis. We felt that weighting the social data with the CLSA sample weights might not be an appropriate approach when it's a person-centered analysis. So we use the raw data for the so social environment um, generation. For the analyses, once we had those social environments and we were looking at our statistical models with the covariates and the outcomes, for both projects, we did check the results weighting the, the data after the social environments had been generated. And with the weighted data and without the weighted data, our results are uh, consistent. So they did not change when we applied the survey weights, but we had already generated the social environment profile. Um. And what about geography and impact? Well, sorry, what about geography and income? Can this impact access to fruits and vegetables? Yes, absolutely. Um, we did control for the province of recruitment and the income of the participants. So um, they were accounted for in the statistical modeling, but 
absolutely, there's those kind of physical and um, resource factors that are very important in terms of food access and the quality of food that, that can be accessed. Um, but since we accounted that in the model, we were really looking at the relationship of the social factors, the aggregated variable with the nutritional outcomes. We'll just quickly do the last two questions, but if you're leaving uh, now, please remember to do your um, survey on your way out. So a uh, question about cooking. I think you said that not cooking yourself was rated as more positive. Um, why would that be? Yeah, we had that conversation ourselves. Is this a good thing or a bad thing, the cooking? Yeah, th thank you, Catherine, for pulling up the slide. Um, so we looked at the individual screen to abbreviated responses and how they differed by the social or if they differed by the social environment profiles. So it's the last one in the table, not cooking their own meals. The stronger profiles had higher pre prevalence of saying that they did not have to cook their own meals. So I think that reflects a relationship status or that there was someone that they lived with that was providing meal uh, cooking, um, whereas the weaker group uh, may have been more likely to live alone or not have that kind of uh, support available for preparation of meals. Now, there's also a debate that maybe cooking your own food is, is a healthful uh, factor and you may prepare better quality meals if you're making them yourself. We'd have to delve into it a little bit more, but I think the observation in this case is reflecting kind of a living arrangement um, or having access to meals that were already prepared. I think we'll make this the last question and hopefully I, I can interpret it right. But I think what they're asking is if there's been a consideration of studying food bank supply and nutrition of, of uh, aged people. It's a very nice question. Uh, we didn't have food bank information in the data, um, but certainly that could be relevant for social factors. So reflecting income and reflecting support um, for the individual, if they're utilizing a food bank, they are likely um, not in that uh, bracket that would have support and, and income resources for accessing sufficient food without using a food bank. Um, I think it, there could be some interesting opportunities to look um, at other sources of Canadian data, perhaps the Canadian Community Health Survey with food insecurity data, food bank usage data. Um, and if we could collect those social factors to look if social environments are also related to food insecurity status and likelihood of utilizing a food bank. But we didn't have that information in this particular project. Well, thank you both again today for your participation in the webinar. We've had lots of good discussion and questions. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the next deadline for data access applications, if you are interested in doing your own research, is January 15th of 2025. Please visit the data access section of our new website to review available data, as well as additional details about the application process. Uh, again, a reminder to please complete your survey upon exiting the session today. And our next web webinar, entitled Physical Activity Behavior in Middle-Aged and Older Adults, will be presented on December 12th at noon by Cassandra Demore, who's a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Rehab Sciences at McMaster. And if you're interested in that, registration details are posted on the CLSA website and also in the chat box. So finally, as always, uh, just remember to promote this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And we also invite you to follow us on Twitter or X at, at CLSE underscore ELCB. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the day.